In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Selena Knight. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 14. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the podcast that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow their e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Pileski. I'm here today with Selena Knight. Selena is the host of the podcast, podcast Bringing Business to Retail, and specializes in helping retailers boost their profits and increase sales. So I wanted to bring Selena on the show to chat today. Hey, Selena, how you doing? Hi, Charles. Thanks so much for inviting me on the show. Yeah, it's great to have you. So I want to, um, I know you specialize in a lot of things about profits and kind of ways and methods of increasing revenue, users, that sort of thing. Um, so I want to bring mm-hmm. you on the show and kind of chat about that. And um, I know e-commerce is one of those things where things are constantly evolving and up to date. So it's one of those things where, you know, if you're not looking at it every day, this side of the business, um, you know, you're flipping back and forth between customer service and a lot of different aspects. So it's one of those things that, you know, there's always time where you should TikTok back and forth and look at marketing, kind of reevaluate what's working, what's not working. Um, so I just wanted to see kind of current tactics or any kind of tricks you have on helping out on the actual profitability revenue side of the business. Uh, I am the lady when it comes to making things easier. <laughs> if I can find if I can find a way to hack something to either automate it or just make it it's so much easier, I am I'm I'm on it. I'm on it. And you are a hundred percent right when it comes to having an e-commerce business. It's easy to just set and forget. It's easy just to put your website up and especially if things are going okay, you think, why why fix what's broken? Yeah, it's not broken, don't fix it. So it's quite easy just to to think you know, I'll just leave it. it, it I'm ticking along. I don't want to affect my sales. You know, maybe if I change something, my sales will go down. And but, there's so many different facets of it. You know, jumping from marketing one day, customer service, logistics, every day you're going to be in a different section. Sometimes you can kind of forget something like this and have to jump back to it, you know? Yeah, especially if you're still, you know, like you said, still packing your own orders. Yeah. And if you're out there doing your own Facebook ads and, and you're trying to do new product research and you're uploading things to the website and you're dealing with the customer experience and you're dealing with returns and exchanges and all those kinds of things, it can be just a little bit overwhelming to think there's probably some extra things I could be doing to make more money, to increase the customer experience. And I am so passionate about trying to give people a customer experience, especially when it comes to online, because that's the thing you have to fight against bricks and mortar. And I I don't care what anyone says, bricks and mortar is not dying because Depending on the statistics that you read, somewhere between 8 and 12% of all sales are online. So that's still a really, it's a really, really long way to go. Every time I hear that stat, it blows my mind. And I know it's accurate, but I'm still like blown away that it's true every time I hear it. All right, let's just call it 20. Like, let's yeah. be super optimistic and say 20% of sales are online. Still amazes me, yeah. Still means that for 80% of everything you want, you are going out and buying it from a physical store. So yeah. what they have. In, as an advantage is they can connect with the customer, they can talk to them, they can answer questions, they can have an experience. You come into a shop and it smells beautiful, it's you know, beautifully merchandised. These are the things that people come back for. And a lot of e-commerce owners think that they can't replicate that. But you know what? There are some really good e-commerce stores and I always use anthropology, probably because I'm a woman. And I'm in Australia, so we don't even have anthropology here. But I'll just go and have a look at the store because it it really excites me. And the worst part is, or the best part is, I can actually fit into most of their clothes. They're not made for women who have who have bits and you know bits and bumps. <laughs> so what they've done is they've managed to get me to love their store, even though the product isn't a hundred percent suitable for me. And that's kind of yeah, you know, that's kind of the, the holy grail. If you can get someone to love the thing, even if they don't, you know, they can't use your product then they've done something really, really well. So it's all about the branding and actually falling in love with, you know, the brand and, you know, and then following them as a, almost a fan. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, Apple does this really well. Lots of sports brands do it well. Lots of surfing brands do it well. And athletic brands do it well. Lululemon is, these will be lots of female based examples, but Lululemon does it really well. They've built a community. So bricks and mortar can have that, that advantage. And e-commerce people 
quite often just think it's just no, there's no point in me trying to compete. I'm never going to compete. But the fact is you can compete. There are a bunch of things that you can do different to every other e-commerce owner that will give you the edge. I like it. Let's, uh, what are some tips? Do you want to hear about them? Yeah, I would definitely like (laughs) to hear about them. You're you're leading us into that. I'm I'm excited. Right. The first one I'm going to say is, I know before we jumped on, I was like, oh, I've got these three things I want to share. But now that I've said that, I really want to share this one other tip. And that is, please, please, please do not just copy and paste a manufacturer's description. I see that all the time and it it kills me a little bit inside each time. I know because all, all the person has who's looking to buy that product to base their purchasing decision on is price. So if you are going to be one of those people who just, you know, scrape something off the manufacturer's website because it's easy, you're going to have to compete on price. So I understand that a lot of people, like a lot of my clients have five and 10,000 SKUs. And in some cases, you can't do that. You can't do that for five or 10,000 SKUs. But what we do is we go and pick the top 50 or the top 100. And if you've got a team, it's actually better, I think, to delegate this to your team and, and say to them, Go and pick up that that thing and what do you like about it? What does it feel like? How big is it compared to your hand? What does it smell like? What would you use it for that's a little bit different? Hmm. And that was a really good one because I my stores were baby stores. And for example, we had these little bags that you would use to put your dirty nappies in if you were out and about. And so that's how we solved them. But then all of a sudden we would have these people coming in saying, I use it for my makeup. My husband started using it when he was traveling because they were waterproof to put his laptop in. Um, You know, I use it when I'm traveling to put my shampoo and conditioner in. I use it when I go to the beach. And so all of a sudden we had this bag that was actually a multi-purpose bag, but it was only ever created to put dirty nappies in, but they were very funky prints and colors. So we started to add to the product description, not just for nappies. And we would, every time a, a comment came in about how people use them, we would add that to the list. And then, of course, once you start to get a big list, you start changing paragraphs. And, you know, if you're looking for a great bag to put your wet swimmers in at, you know, after a hard day at the beach, well, people are going to, to search for bag for wet swimmers. So, yep. you know, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in just copying and pasting. But if you do nothing else, and in fact, I've got a cheat sheet. I can, hand, I can, I can give you a link to, this, to a cheat sheet that shows you yeah, four great. easy ways to change out your product description and the things that you can look at to make sure that that description is a little bit more palatable to your audience. And the thing is, you know your audience. Yeah, and we see that all the time with vendors. You know, literally the descriptions come over like red shirt, blue widget, that sort of thing. And it's just the the simplest thing. And people are just taking that in bulk and mass listing it. Um, but when you actually start to go out and do that kind of work, you have now something unique, some asset that not every other site has because you built it and it's yours. And that's yes. the value add that now you have something no one else has. And it's just not competing on price anymore. It's now you have something that's unique to you and to your site. So I love that. For sure. And so let's take your blue shirt. So I'm looking for a certain brand of blue shirt. So I, I, I put it into Amazon or I Google it and all I see is blue shirt. And I actually, I really want to know if it's a slim fit shirt or is it baggy? Because when I see it on the plastic model, the, you know, the, the deep etched picture, you can't tell. And so I I recently had this happen. I bought a handbag and I knew the handbag color that I wanted and I knew the brand that I wanted, but they didn't stock them here in Australia. So I was going to have to get it from England. And so I was going through their website. I'm a little bit fussy about my handbags because I like to make sure the strap is long enough to go over my shoulder. And I, I could not find anywhere on any website where it said if it was long enough to go over, if the handbag straps were long enough to go over your shoulder. And it was, it was, it was make or break. It was either, and it, it was a birthday present. So it was several hundreds of dollars for a leather head handbag. And I didn't want to have it shipped from overseas only to find out it didn't meet my most essential criteria. So in the end, I just ended up Googling the images and I finally, after pages and pages, found a blog post from somebody who bought it, who had it over their arm. And I was like, I can buy it now. <laughs> but I've, something as simple as that. I've run that before where you have a need and it's a very particular, I'm going to buy it based off this one quirky need. And if that's not in the description, you literally, same thing, you have to just search and search and search. Um, these shirts right here, we brought bought a bunch of them in bulk. 
and the first run of them was very small, about a couple, and it was a different type of shirt, and they were literally shaped like a square, and you put them on and said, I'm shaped like a, like a rectangle. It's very odd. <laughs> um, and then had to actually call different companies and find out, okay, I want shirts that are shaped you know, like a regular person, not like a rectangle. And that took some, it actually took phone calls at that point, just because it wasn't listed online. And it took a lot of searching to find, you know, which manufacturer actually had normal fit shirts. Um, so and how many sales did they lose? Because they didn't have something. And that's really important. Like the thing I'm talking about is a little bit quirky, but I have to admit in women buying handbag land, it's kind of a staple. Yeah. You know, is it, is it a handbag that you have to hold in your hand or is it one that can go on your shoulder? So I was a little bit disappointed. It's the only thing I could fault with that brand. The packaging arrived, the shipping, you know, it was beautiful. The... The experience on the website was fantastic. It had pictures inside the bag. It had 360 degree views of the bag, everything except this one little thing. And I probably should email and tell them. But again, I just wouldn't have, if I didn't find the blog somewhere else, yep. I just wouldn't have bought that bag. And there's a $350 sale that a company didn't get. Yeah. And it's all about just taking that data and then bringing it to the pages they already have. So they already have a listing. They already have, like you said, 90% of it done just not kind yeah. of some final little details. And that's the stuff that people are Googling for that's at that long tail that you'll literally yes. rank number one for, for, and for that. I was yeah. going to say, I don't, I, don't, I don't profess to be an SEO expert. I, I, I know very little. You know, I've got people I go to for SEO. But let's be honest, if you write in your own language, yeah. there's a good chance that something that comes out is going to be something that someone is searching for. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing with that. You're not trying to trick anyone. You're not trying to do anything for Google. You're just writing for people. And it turns out yes. if you write, like you said, in your language, other people use that same language to search. And that's what ranks. Um, it's not about trying to play like a game or a trick. It's just about talking the way people talk uh, and writing. It's just, about, it's just about making life easier for someone to buy because we put all these hurdles in front of people. And if, if, if you rang me, I w if I was your t-shirt company and you rang me and said, you know, is this a slim fit? Is it a, a wide fit? Is it a relaxed fit? And I got more than one of those phone calls at any time. I would think this is important information. Yep. But the problem with big companies is the person who answers that question is probably not going to see the same question again. It could be someone on, on reception or you get sent off to customer support and an email comes back and no one's actually keeping track. So this is a benefit that you have if you're an independent retailer, because it's just you and maybe a small team. So if you have something like Zendesk that you're using for customer help, or even if you're using Facebook Messenger, every question that you get is something you should be putting on your website. Unless it's like, where's my parcel? And even if it's, where's my parcel? You have to ask yourself, is the information that I'm giving out enough for somebody to, tra to track where their parcel is? And yeah, we all know that there's the person who buys it, expects, expects it the next day or expects it the same day. <laughs> so excluding the crazies, every question that you get, I believe you should be fixing something on your website to answer that question. Yep. That's a very good, we, uh, we do the same rule of thumb here, spark shipping. And, you know, every time support questions come in, if we get the same question multiple times, we're writing knowledge based articles and screenshots and everything. And just realizing, you know, you shouldn't keep getting the same question. And if you are, this you can this value can add there and um you can help everyone out by answering that so yeah that's oh, a good we could one. get a whole different road with that with that yeah. no, <laughs> no, we really could that's it's taken a long time to get there but it's other, very important yeah and that's that's not something that i teach my retailers to do is if you get a question yep. that becomes your next newsletter which also is your next blog post which is also the thing that you're promoting on your social media because we all we all know about recycling content you don't have to create a separate newsletter and a separate blog post and separate social media. It can just be that one thing. And if it's an FAQ, then why can't you create that and put it on your website? So the next time somebody's looking at how to use that, even if they've already bought the product, they're like, how cool are these people? They actually showed me how to use it. When I want the extras or when I want something else, I'm going to go back to them because they clearly know what they're talking about. Yeah. It's, um, I think I mentioned it before on the show, the, uh, the Gary V quote, Gary Vaynerchuk, do document don't create. Instead of trying to actually create content, you're using the content that you're naturally generating from the business, and that's your newsletter. That's your, you know, FAQ. That's where it comes from. So you're building it anyway. Why not just use that as your, you know, what you're talking about to your users and your audience? I have a little, I have a little secret that I use to create content, which is I don't create it at all. Um, in <laughs> in like e-commerce and in, in my retail stores, I just used to get my customers to write the blogs. 
<laughs> they were thinly disguised as product reviews. Okay. But I always, you know, I, I had several shops, so it was very difficult. My team used to write exactly what we were talking about. If they got questions, we'd write that's the next blog post. We'd have guest blog posts. But then I was thinking there's no other way to get it straight from the horse's mouth than to ask the customer what did you think of this product? What did you like about it? Where did you take it? What did you use it for? Okay. What other things did you use it for? So all those things we were talking about earlier. But when it's in somebody else's language, again, now you've got somebody else's point of view, somebody else's, you know, in air quotes, long tail keywords. Yeah. Because not everybody thinks the same. So uh, that's a little hack that I have. Is I, I like just that. outsource content to my customers. So you would essentially ask them after like a follow-up email, was it some sort of like automated email or what would you do to actually... Like how would, no, how would you implement that? I had a little group. So I had like a little VIP group and I used to, if, if a supplier sent me product to test out, I would say, I've got this widget that needs to be tested. Who, who would it suit best for? And the deal was that they would write a review. And we had a little bit of a template on what they had to cover, yep. which was things like, where did you use it? What was great about it? Who would it be best for? And because we're talking babies, you know, some babies are skinny, some babies are chubby. So those kinds of things for parents were really important. Is is this is this product going to be okay for my kid with a skinny belly and great big chubba bubba legs? Yep. That's what I had. Mm. <laughs> because, you know, it's kind of like people. Some people have big hips. Some people have no butt. And you want to know, is this product suitable for you? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a little, that's a little hack that I have. I have, is two, just I have two kids at home. Content. I have two kids at home currently, and they're very different. Uh, very different kids, very different shapes, very different personalities. So I definitely know uh, where you're coming from there. And you want to know, yeah. you know, does my, does this product work with my child? Because um, they're all different. They're all different, yeah. and and adults are exactly the same. Yeah. And, and even things like you know a TV. Actually, let me just grab an example from last night. Talking about kids, I was at my daughter's school. And they now have bring your own device to learn. So they can bring an iPad or a laptop. And the principal came in and said, it doesn't matter what you've got, but if you're looking to buy something, we suggest a Chromebook because they've done loads of tests. They're really sturdy. They're really easy to use. So if your kid hasn't used technology to date, they're going to be really easy to function. They connect with our Wi-Fi. And you know, that's the one that we've chosen. And so she was giving us all the examples as to why this would be the best for the child who didn't have any technology experience. Now, my kid's nine and can use Photoshop, so for her, <laughs> she wanted something a little bit more advanced. But this is what I liked. It wasn't just like this was we recommend you buy a Chromebook. Yeah. It was we've done the research and this is what the parents have come or this is what the Department of Education has come back with as the most rugged, the most suitable for people at all different ages. Yep. I like that. Okay, but let's get to some tech, right? Because yeah. we're talking about tech. And we're talking about customer experience. Yeah, I, and feel, we talked I, about... I feel like we can go off on a tangent. This is good. I know. We could, I could talk forever about customer <laughs> experience. <laughs> but one of the things that I think probably the most underutilized page on a website is the post-purchase page. Yep. Now, I don't know. You tell me, Charles. Is it different for men than it is for women? If I've just bought, let's say, my handbag, I just bought my handbag and I put my credit card details and I press confirm. Sometimes I've hovered over it a little while and I finally press confirm. <laughs> and then the next page that comes up is thanks for your order. I am on cloud nine. I've just purchased the handbag that I've been looking at for the last six months. I finally found the photo that says that it's okay because it has the long shoulder straps. Now what? <laughs> yep. It actually, um, I've done this before where then, you know, I go back even days later and realize actually for these headphones in particular, I found a, um, a Bluetooth adapter that fits these particularly, but like days later and I came back and purchased that as kind of like an upsell. I gave myself an upsell basically. And I realized that after, wow, I did that to myself. But that's one of those examples where I should have, if I thought of that at that time, I would have just purchased it instantly without thinking. But you didn't have to think about it. This is, this is the, this is yep. the job of the e-commerce store's owner yep. is to say, Hey Charles, I see you like those headphones. Do you know what works really well with them? This Bluetooth adapter. Yep. Hey, we've already got your order. You've already paid for shipping. Did you want to add this in? And, you know, places like Vistaprint do this really, really well. They do it annoyingly. But you as an e-commerce owner yes. can just do this once. That you try to go to GoDaddy and you try to check out on a domain and they ask, you know, <gasps> do you want, like, a website with it? Do you want, like, this? Do you... 
<laughs> you're like, no, I yes. really just want to buy my domain for eight dollars. And you know, do you want this entire like SEO pack? And no, 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 <laughs> no. So yeah, I've seen people go the other way, but small people, small e-commerce shops don't do this very well. And you're right, it's amazing because and. Yeah, you want, that could you be want your average order. Yeah. Yeah, that could be that could be double your order. Yeah. Like I'm not sure. Let's say that your headphones cost two hundred dollars and the Bluetooth was a hundred. You just fifty percent increased your order. For for free. For no acquisition. For free. You for are, somebody yeah. who was on a high, yep. who was already excited about buying. And the key to this is curating the information. Yep. I think it's you can't just buy the headphones and then it might be like, Hey Charles, do you want this shirt? Yeah. Like, <laughs> No, I came here for headphones. Yep. Or, hey, Charles, do you want this thing that doesn't actually work with the headphones? Yeah. So I believe that you can't do this badly. If you're going to do it, you have to sit down and curate it. And there are programs that will allow you to do this that says if Charles buys the headphones, this is the thing we're going to suggest to him. Now, some people will go a, one more step and say your Bluetooth was 100, but then there's another thing that you could connect that was $40 or even $30, like a really low price point, 10% of the purchase price. And so it might be, if you didn't want that, we just go one more and say, well, hey, would you like this SD card? I don't know, something. That's that's, that's a small amount of money. And you'd be like, yeah, you know what? I actually do need a new SD card. I'll pop that in. I think you can get away with two before you really annoy people. And sometimes you want them when you realize, oh, I actually need these like cables to go with it, other sort of things. So it, there is something where you can do this, and it's yeah. not, and it's not the worst thing. And you're actually helping people. That's the thing. Because um, I, I default that, with another that's purchase. A boom. Yeah, <laughs> that's a boom moment. Is yeah, people don't believe this is kind of upselling in a different way, and upselling to me is the perfect way to help a customer if you do it ethically. So great cable, great. You should have jumped in with that example a little bit earlier. <laughs> yeah. But the cable is really <laughs> obvious because. I'm not like, I I love technology, but when it comes to putting the pieces together, I may not know that I need the cable as well. So one, you had a choice right back at the beginning to bundle it with the cable for me and make my life a whole bunch easier. Or two, if you want to get to that point down the track where you think, actually, this is a really common cable most people would have. So we'll just throw it on at the end, but you need to decide that you need to think about where your customer journey goes and is it better to put it on the front end or is it better to put it on the back end or is it better to do both? Because if you prime somebody, if I've gone to those headphones and seen cable not included, there's a drop down box that says, do you want to include the cable for $19.99? I'm like, eh, I might have one of those. By the time I've looked around the website, I've got through the cart and I've got to the end. I'm like, I don't know if I have one of those cables. Yep. So I've bought the thing. I'm excited. I'm like, yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be three days before my headphones come. And then it says, hey, are you sure you don't want the cable? And there's a question. Are you sure you don't need the cable? Yep. Or, hmm, no, I'm not sure I don't need the cable. So I'll just throw that in. Because, you know, I'd rather have two than get the headphones. Them. Well, and if you can add that with an offer also to include shipping as part of the the first uh, part of the order, it's almost a no brainer when you start thinking about it and going, you know, okay, fine. Like it's, and you've already taken on your credit card. You've already done the mental leap to, you know, make a hundred plus dollar purchase. So that little extra, it's seems a lot easier now than trying to sell them, you know, an $8 cable. Um, it's a lot easier to sell them a hundred dollar pair of headphones and then add a cable on later than starting with the cable. Um, cause it doesn't go yes. the other way. You don't, you know, you don't start with the cable no. and buy some headphones. It, um, but it always works well that way. And if you could increase every single order by 10%, yep. so your $20 cable for the $200 headphones, the $10 cable for the $100 headphones, if you could increase every order by 10%, what is that going to do to your bottom line? For nothing. You've done no marketing. You've done no advertising, nothing extra. And that's the key. But now you have a 10% increase in revenue. Yeah. And the key there is you've already acquired the customers. You've already paid for your Facebook ads, your AdWords, whatever it is. But you're just adding on that now. So this, this, yeah. that extra 10, 20% just comes out of nowhere. Uh, it's just, it's pure profit yeah. at that point. It's pure profit. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this is where so many independent retailers fail. Yep. Yeah. And can I tell you why? Yeah. They don't want to spend the four, five, 10, $15 a month for a bit of software that does that for them. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. And pe- what people don't realize is you don't need to start when you do something like this, you don't need to do it on every product day one. You don't need to roll it out this site wide, massive thing. It's going to take you six months to implement. You could start off with just your top five products, whatever, whatever that number is, your top couple products and slowly kind of roll out from there. And that's really the way of implementing. You don't have to do this big bang where you figure out everything at a time. You can do it, you know, dip a toe in the water and just get started. Yeah, and I probably wouldn't suggest if you've got 5,000 SKUs, I probably wouldn't suggest doing it to all 5,000 because that's, like you said, that's going to take you, for, you're going to get caught up in the doing yep. rather than I, I, I have a success. Well, I would rather you do your top 50 products, the ones that you know day in, day out are going to sell. And then we'll move to number two, yep. which is the hack, the second hack that you can put in place, which is super, super easy. And these are, we call them one click upsells. Mm-hmm. So it's similar to the post purchase page. The post-purchase page, I think, is the best because somebody's already on a high. Like you said, you've already acquired the customer. They've already given you money. This is the step before that says, we'll go with your headphones. You've got the headphones and it says you've got to cart and the one-click upsell is, hey, Charles, would you like to get the cable? So instead of putting it in the product description, we're now going, would you like to get the cable as a one-click upsell? The cable's not the best example because where I like to use this is not a really cheap opt-in. Um, I've got a customer who sells skincare and we use it on her website and you can buy two instead of one. So okay. it's it's it tends to be a much bigger upsell in terms of the skincare cream is $30. Did you want to get two for $49.99? Yep. So you can add a discount in here. And of course, this all depends on your margins depending on the product. So you really have to think about what you're doing here. But even if you just went with the cable, then again, you've got your 10% increase. And then you could even do the post-purchase as well. If there's something else that goes well, we could add that in. But the one-click upsell is just a simple pop-up that says, hey, if you like these headphones, you usually need a cable. It doesn't come with the cable. Did yep. you want to add this, this in? And again, this has the ability for the skincare lady where she buys two, that's a hundred percent increase in her order. Well, take away the fact we have a small discount in there, but yeah, you know, a significant almost doubling of revenue. Yep. And sometimes she'll do three. So it's buy one and get three months worth. Hmm. And then there'll be another discount in there as well. And that's a discount they can't see unless they get to this point in the funnel. So there's something not on the site, they're not finding out about, about nope. this. It's a surprise right at the very end of the checkout. Yes. Yep. So once they get to, depending on which piece of software you use, which will depend on whether you're using Shopify or Magento or whatever, sometimes it will appear once they add it to cart, so while you're on the same page, and sometimes it will happen at checkout. It will be like, hey, I see you've got this in your cart. Did you want to get three months' worth? And I, I sort of had this question where if you offered someone three months' worth of face cream, are you actually reducing their customer loyalty? Because instead of coming back every single month, they're now coming back every three months. Doesn't happen. They'll still come back every month because then they decide they want something else. Yep. Generally speaking, from what I've seen, that they don't just avoid you altogether because they love your stuff. And you've just made it easier. Like, I don't have to come back. I don't have to remember to come back when my face cream is just about to run out. Yeah, it definitely... Um... I've always done the the Dollar Shave Club. That's one of those examples um, you see everywhere. Yep. You even do a year subscription, but every month you're still getting that order and they still keep in touch with you. So you actually get this little like flyer every month, which I find, you know, a great idea. So you still remember, oh, that's, you know, my raises aren't just magically appearing in the mail. They, um, you know, you know where they come from. You start remembering the brand. And at the end of the year, when you have to renew that subscription, you know it's coming and they've kind of kept in touch with you over the course of the year. So even in a year, you can definitely extend that as long as you kind of, keep in touch with your customers and give a reason to talk to them, which they do. Yeah, for sure. And here's another thing with subscriptions. Here's another little hack that I use to add thousands of dollars. I had a, I have a, I had a customer who'd had a subscription based business. And so just before every month when the product would go out, so about 10 days beforehand, she would send an email to everyone on the list saying, Hey, you've already paid for free shipping with your product because it's included in the subscription. Is there anything else you wanted to add to your order? Because it will ship for free. And the first time we did it, I think she did nearly a thousand dollars extra in sales. Yeah. The free shipping is the thing where they've already paid for it. Yeah. It was already incorporated into the price of the subscription. So it didn't cost, she wasn't losing any money. This was literally pure profit. And people were so happy. They were so thankful to her 
for saying, you, you were looking out for me. You, you had my back. You, you weren't trying to rip me off and try and make me pay for free shipping again. Yep. But that one email, which we ended up automating, over $1,000 every month extra. And that number just keeps going up because people, people get ready for it now. They're like, oh, I just won't buy until I do the thing. Rather than just not buying at all, you know, quite, quite often people think, oh, I need, need a new pair of scissors because she sold fabric. Instead of going, oh, I'll shop around, she just people would just get to the point where they just be like, she's going to email me in a couple of weeks. You know, most it's going to be is thirty days. If you remember after the day after the email, the the order came, I can just wait and I'll just make sure I get it with free shipping because, like you said, customers love free shipping. But they were more excited about the fact that she was looking out for them and she wasn't trying to rip them off. Yeah, it's that mental reminder where you know you have to buy something and you you want to almost set yourself like a to do. And the way I've even done yes. it is with like the Amazon app, I put it in the shopping cart on my phone and then forget, forget about it and come back a week later and realize, oh yeah, I did want those, you know, I did need that extra memory card or whatever it was. And then on my next order, I order a few things at once. Um, so I've even done that where if you know something like that's coming in the email and especially if they showed you, you know, here are some, here are three things we're highlighting this month in that email, you're going to get clicks on those, on that email. And there's gonna be a very high click to rate on that. Yeah. And people love you for it. Yeah. And, but a lot of e-commerce owners, a lot of store owners just think, I feel like I'm being a little bit used car salesman. No. But it all comes back to this ethical upselling. It's like being genuinely appreciative of the customers that you have and what can you do to make their life easier, to make them happier, and to make them really glad that they shopped with you rather than going to the local big box store to get an SD card. Yep. Okay, yep. I've got one more. Okay, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, the last one that people – just fail to use. This is probably my second most effective but least used page on a website is that 404 page, uh-huh. the error page. When somebody has searched for something, maybe you had a link to a blog years ago and someone stumbled across it and they click it and they get to your website and the product either no longer exists or it's been moved, it's had a name change and they get that 404 error page. Yep. Most of us do nothing with that. It's just like some people have a search, a search bar, you know, what were you looking for? But here's the thing. This is a page where you have your first chance to engage a customer. Yep. So my suggestion is usually to make use of that page with some kind of opt-in, some kind of email opt-in, freebie, download, checklist, hmm. all those sorts of things. And you'll know this. And it could just be the same opt-in that you have on your homepage, which Please, if it is, get 10% off for signing up to my newsletter. I would whack you across the head if I possibly could. <laughs> yeah, those newsletters, <laughs> because no one signs up for those. Research shows that 10% is not enough for anybody to choose to buy versus when they weren't going to buy anyway. Yep. So all you're doing is literally taking 10% out of your pocket and saying, hey, have some money. Yep. It's about 25 to 30% before it's enough of a motivator for somebody who was maybe sitting on the fence to move to purchasing. So what can you do on that page? What is the thing that you could download? So for me, going back to my baby store, we often had a download with something like download the complete checklist for your baby bag to take to hospital. Yep. So it's kind of generic. And maybe if you had slightly older kids, our shop only stocked from zero to two. So there's a good chance that even if your baby was a little bit older, you could potentially become pregnant again. But it was very generic and maybe not everybody would sign up for it. But we knew that probably... 60% of our customers were pregnant. And the thing so, with that is, you know, when you sign up for that as a user, you know, you, you have an expectation of what you're going to receive. So, you know, you sign up for that, you get that email back, you know exactly what's going to be in the email. It's your expectations. When you start offering things like a newsletter, you don't really have expectations of what's in this newsletter. Do I even want it? doesn't make sense. Like, do I really want to stay in touch with these people? But when you actually get very specific with an offer like that, I found that's the best thing. That's one of the best things you can do of actually saying, give me your email address, but here's what you're going to get in return. Not just give me email address and, you know. We'll send you the latest offers. I'll send you some offers, maybe sometimes, <laughs> I don't know, when, whenever I want. You know, no one responds yes. to that. So I love that about it being super specific. I call those, are we, are we, we're, not, we're rated PG this yeah. way. This, this, okay. I call those buy my stuff emails. Yep. Those emails that people send out that are just like new product, new in store, blah, blah, blah. Yep. I'm, I'm all about writing emails that people actually want to open, which could be something like five things I learned I should have packed in my baby bag. Yep. And they can still be products that you stock, 
but you're giving me some information to put that into context as well. And it can be really generic. I've got a homeware store that I work with and she just has five, she changes, changes it out. She has five ways to update your home for winter and then she changes it out for each season. But she could have just done a generic five ways to update your home, get new cushions, put new drapes up, get a new lamp, you know, all these yeah. kinds of things. But as a customer, if you send, like you said, when you send me that, I'm like, wow, you're not just sending me buy my stuff emails. I probably will open the next email now to see what it is you're going to tell me. And just don't follow that up with a buy my stuff email. <laughs> yeah. You realize you need several of those, you know, actual um, content heavy emails and actually provide some value before you can start sending that buy my stuff email. You need to really build a relationship. It's not about just getting email address and then you know, hitting them as high as you can with buy my stuff. You need to really provide yep. some value before you expect something in return. Yes. Yep. And uh, that that's Gary's, you know, jab, jab, right hook. Oh, yeah, that, um, we yeah. call it give, give, get, yep. so, or give, give, ask. Uh, so, yeah, it's just knowing what your customers want. And, again, people are probably thinking, oh, I don't know, I sell all these different things. I don't know what to what to offer. Go back through all of those emails that you've gotten in the past. Go back through yeah, go and check out your competitors' websites and see if people have used the review or the Q&A function. I mean, that's another thing you could add in. But if you've got that Q&A type review function, what are people saying about this product over and over again? Or what are people saying on their Yacht Pro reviews about this store that you could potentially turn into an FAQ, the cheat sheet, the download? And this doesn't have to be high tech. I mean, if you're running an e-commerce store, you probably have some kind of technical ability. But if you don't, we're talking a Word document, save it as a PDF. Yep. <laughs> you don't have to get the graphic designer and all that kind of stuff. Just give somebody some information. Yeah, you can even, I've seen people before, you just save that as a PDF, put that in Dropbox, generate the link with Dropbox. That's what you're sending people. You're not, you know, you're Done. not doing this. Yeah, you're not, you're not going over the top. It's not something that's going to be, you know, you're making a big project out of it. Word doc, save to PDF, put that in Dropbox, share that link, and then just get it out there and then iterate on that and find out what people like and see how they respond to that and start just doing it and not, you know, not spend, like we said before, months planning it. Uh, don't, don't get caught up in the doing. So no. many people get caught up in doing. Now, with the 404, 404 page, there are a whole bunch of things that you can put on that page. And I guess just think about this is the front door to your store. This is somebody walking past, if you think of a bricks and mortar store, the equivalent of someone got off the bus and they walked past your shop front window. Yep. What do you want them to see? And even if you change that thing that you're 404 to be the thing that you're promoting this month, at least when they hit your site, instead of getting, oops, what you're looking for is gone, it could be check out this season's rain, rain boots. Yep. Oh, I, I, I'm in the right place. You know, this is not a furniture shop. I, I'm in the right clothing and design place. So, and then there's a button here to continue shopping. And that's where a lot of people don't add the continue shopping or head to the website. They just go back. If get you get a 404 over. page, you just go back again yeah, and you continue don't, searching. You don't want to make it look like a, neg a negative thing. It's almost, hey, you know, we didn't find this, but we did find this other stuff for you. Um, not, you know, stop. You've done something wrong. Because um, that's how they mostly word it, that, you know, stop, back up you're wrong. Don't do this. Um, yeah. It's like, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't know what you were, you didn't know what you were looking for well enough. And look, if you're smart, you would go through and do the next level. And if you can see that your referral traffic is going to a specific page, you do a redirect or you could put something on that page, but that 404 page is so important. Maybe you could even have a video. Um, yeah, these really cool videos that people are doing now of their fulfillment, you know, just people in the back office packaging. So at least, I don't know, there's a connection now. I now can see that you're real people. You're yep. not just some faceless brand. Stick, stick a video on there of you saying, hey, welcome to my store. Sorry, I, I sent you to a page that didn't work. Below is a button. There's a search function below. You can click the continue shopping to go to the front page of the website. Here are four products that I recommend. This month we're promoting rain boots. Yep. Love it. Yeah, that's great because it's, if you even dig through your analytics, I bet a lot of people will be surprised um, if you have analytics in your 404 page. But if you start, if you do have those and you search through your analytics and see, wow, this, site, this 404 page is being hit way more than some other pages that you actually expect, that you actually spend time designing and usually have this generic whatever that you don't go to and you don't kind of think about. But if you actually dig into that, 
I bet a lot of people could um, have a bit more traffic there than, than they realize. So that's a great tip. Yeah. So even, you know, one, you could have got more people on your newsletter list yep. or two, you could have sold more product. If you just had a product on that page that you're promoting for the month, maybe somebody gets there and goes, I really need some new rain boots or put a selection of products up that represent your store. Maybe it's your 20 best selling products. Yep. If you, yeah, if you, if you don't want to be changing these things out often, 20 best selling products. So at least when people come, they're like, this is the right store. I haven't hit yeah, that that link wasn't necessarily broken. It's just that thing sold out. Now I can either continue searching. Maybe I might even hit up the chat. There's something else you could put on your forum. That's a really good idea. I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, and what you're doing, you're changing a negative experience to a positive one. And you're making it, like yes. you said, stop, you did something wrong, into, hey, don't worry about it. We did something wrong, but we're going to try to help you out and make this better. So that's, you know, that's a great thing. And I think customers will appreciate people for that. So that's a good tip. So those, so let me just recap where we went. First yeah. of all was the copywriting and I'm going to give you a link to how to become a copywriting ninja in less than five minutes. Perfect. We'll put that in the um, show notes. So Great. The other one was really utilizing that post-purchase page, but creating an ethical upsell in the process. And the step before that was the one-click upsells. And then number four was utilizing that 404 page. And there's so many things you can add to that page, but making sure that you actually get some use for it and you enhance how the customer is going to see you. So do you think, Charles, that the people who are listening are thinking, I can actually improve the customer experience? It is possible? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that do. those <laughs> I hope that those tips make people realize that, yes, whilst you're in, co in competition with bricks and mortar, you're also in competition with other e-commerce yeah. agents. And if you can do just those, if you can just do one of those four things, I think you're going to get a serious edge on your competitors. I totally agree. So I think that's a great tips, probably a great place to end it as well. Um, I'll definitely put those in the show notes. So if anyone wants those, they can click and find out more. Um, and if anyone wants to kind of keep in touch with you or follow you, where can they find you? I am at selenanight.com, which is S-A-L-E-N-A-K-N-I-G-H-T.com. I've got the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. And each week I put out a video and a podcast with great strategies for retailers online and bricks and mortar. Uh, you know, some of them are tech-based, some of them are hiring-based strategy, all that kind of stuff. But each week you'll get a new strategy to help you grow your store. Awesome. It was great chatting with you, Selena. Thank you. It was thank so nice being here. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one.